So you know what they would do? They'd say, give it to Therese. If it was bad meat. See, the French have a tendency to mask bad meat with good sauces. Yeah. They make the best sauces in the world, and that came about because they had bad meat. And so they covered up Tough, with good sauces. You know? So, but there were times when the meat was so bad that nobody there could eat it, and they'd say, give it to Therese, she'll eat it. She'll eat anything. You know, give it to Mikey, he'll eat it. Give it to give Therese, it to she'll, Therese eat it. she'll eat anything. She they that never knew that, that Therese way. couldn't stand it. She never showed them. Therese never let them know how ill she was, even as she was dying. She looked so beautiful, and she had such a beautiful smile on her face. No one ever knew how now, seriously ill she now was. Now, we told you that it was a rule of the discalced Carmelite reform, St. Teresa of Avila, that no more than two people from one family could be in a single convent. Well, also it was a rule, and of course the Martin family broke that, four of them wound up in the convent. Only one wound up as a visitation nun. So of the five girls, they were all nuns, but one of them was visitation, the other four were Carmelites. It was also a rule uh, of the, of the that you had to be like 21 years old to enter <laughs> the Carmel. Therese made a decision at age 14 that she was gonna be a Carmelite. So she wanted to enter the order at 15 years old. And they said, you're crazy. First she had to get her father to go along with it. Well, she was able and she was so beautiful and he loved her so much, he couldn't resist anything she wanted. She got him to say, okay. Then her uncle, who was her mother's brother, who was really in charge of the family, w refused. He said, wait until you're at least 18, 19 years old. This is crazy, you're 14 years old. She was able to get her sister Pauline to, to come soften his heart, and so he said, okay. Then there was the priest who was in charge of the Carmel. And he said, no way. There is no way that we'll let anybody in the Carmel under 21 years old. And that's it. However, and this is where he made his mistake, I'm not the last word. The bishop is the last word. So she <laughs> crying. She he opened up a church. crack in the door. And she crying, was crying. goes out of the church. And her father says, I know, I know, I know. We'll make an appointment with the bishop. <laughs> so you've seen pictures. And when you go in the back, look at one of the books that shows a picture of her. A picture of her with her hair in an upsweep. <laughs> It was the only time you ever see her in an upsweep, and that was to make her look older, so that when she went to the bishop, she wouldn't look 14, she'd look 15. <laughs> and of course, that had no effect on the bishop. And he said, well, we'll hold the decision in abeyance until you come back from your pilgrimage. To, they were going to a, on a pilgrimage to Rome because it was Pope Leo XIII's 50th anniversary as a priest, and they, they had a whole, a whole diocese, diocesan pilgrimage. First they were going to Paris and then to Loreto and then to Rome. She said, if I have to go to the Holy Father himself, <laughs> I will get into the Carmel at 15 years old. And so when she went to the audience with the Pope, she's waiting on the line, they're all waiting on the line and everybody's going up to the Pope and saying something and he blesses them and they go. So finally he was getting tired because it was a huge group from this diocese. And they said, okay, no more speaking, just go up there, get a blessing and leave. Well, she goes up and she says, Holy Father, in honor of your 50th anniversary. Now this is 14 years old. 14 years old. In honor of your 50th anniversary, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if you would tell them to let me go into the Carmel at 15? And he doesn't know what she's talking about. And, and so the priest says, well, it's being taken care of by the, the diocese. So he, she says to him, well, just do what your superiors tell you. But if you told them, Holy Father, they'd have to listen to you, they'd have to do what you say. And this went on and on until finally, the Swiss guards came, picked her up, and bought her. No, no, yeah, but she, she, she grabbed a hold of the Pope's leg. She wouldn't let go of the Pope's leg. And so the, the Swiss guards are that? dragging her out of the room, and she's holding on to the Holy Father's leg. <laughs> 
But there is a lesson to be taught here. Because then she was persona non grata <laughs> in her town, in her diocese. The bishop wouldn't answer any of the father's calls or the uncle's calls or letters, anything. They didn't want to know her because there was a local newspaper who had covered their pilgrimage, took pictures of it, sent it back, and it was all over the news. She newspaper. made the front pages. <laughs> she was completely just depressed. But it was Christmas time. She had planned to be in the Carmel for Christmas. And so she went down to the Carmel to visit her sister Pauline at Christmas, and she was really, really depressed. And when she came back, there was a present that her sister Celine had made for her. And it's still there today. If you ever go to the Carmel, or to the house, oh, yeah, the the, the, it's, it's there. It's, it's a, a little, little boat with the baby Jesus on it. And it has one word on that boat. It says, abandonment. Abandonment. So after she had done all her wheeling and dealing, it didn't work. The Lord was telling her, just do one thing, abandon it, leave it to me. So she finally let go of it. Within two weeks, she had permission to enter the Carmel. Praise Jesus. You know, the saints all had a sense of humor. Mother Angelica has the most tremendous sense of humor. And uh, as we all know, I have not seen our priest frown yet. Uh, Teresa of Avila was a kick. She um, loved to be dressed just so. Her habit had to be just so. There was just a little tad of vanity in there. She had to have white starched habit. You know, just, she looked just spit polished clean. So it's raining outside. And so she says, well, I'm not going out in that. Because so when the raindrops waits. hit the starch, it's going to ruin it. So she waits until the rain has stopped. Then she gets on the horse, and she's about, and she starts out. And the horse steps into this mud, and the mud comes onto her habit. And she looks up at Jesus, and she said, if this is the way you treat friends, no wonder you don't have many. So they had a sense of humor. She had a rule, no sour-faced nuns. She would not allow sour-faced nuns in the community. Out. She said one sour face will bring down the whole community. St. Francis- true. think about it. You know, you're living with these people day and night, and if one of them is a, a downer, everything's gonna be a downer. St. Francis of Assisi, do you know what he would do? I mean, everybody was attracted to him. Everybody wanted to join his community. I mean, thousands and thousands. Once he got it started, they just flocked to him because he was so charismatic. He was joyful. I mean, he wasn't even a good preacher, you know. St. Anthony was a great preacher, but not Francis. And as Father said, Francis says, and if you must, sp uh, speak. No, Francis was a living sign. He was joy personified, and he attracted people. He was just like, you know... Uh, the little flowers to the bees, they, everybody just can't. But what would happen, he would start attracting eggheads, people that were very intelligent. And they wanted more than just this life. I mean, they wanted theology and they wanted to learn things and he didn't trust books. He didn't want anything to do with books. So he would take them out into the field. And he'd say, okay, do what I do. And I mean, just he would just, me. and he would be jumping. I'm not supposed jumping to jump. Up and He's down. jumping up and down and, and dancing and singing. And if they couldn't do that, they couldn't handle that. They couldn't join the community. He wanted fools for Christ. Are we willing to be fools for Christ? You see, you can be a saint and be happy. You can be a saint and be joyful. You should be joyful. You want to be joyful. I mean, you don't want to be a saint just so you can walk around like this. What do you got to be sad about? You know we're all going to go to heaven. What do you got to be sad about? No. Francis insisted on joy in his community. Why? Because joy attracts. This is what attracts others. And don't we have this opportunity? Fool for Christ. How can you be a fool for Christ? I'll tell you. In this church, it's very easy. You're got your uh, in a company of people who are spiritual 
holy people. I've watched you. I, I shared that with you. So when you bow, you're not being a fool for Christ. Everybody's bowing. You genuflect, you're not being a fool for Christ. 50% are genuflecting. You receive on the tongue, you're not being a fool for Christ. Most of the people coming up are receiving on the tongue. But go into a church where there are no kneelers, and we got them, honey. And kneel. And I mean, kneel on the floor. Just think about it. When everybody is sitting during see, the consecration. You see where, the, where the railing is, your nose is right where the railing is. So you're kneeling and all the, you remember those pictures of Kilroy? Especially back me. Boy? All you see is a nose and a head. Now, that's a fool. You want to be a fool for Christ? That's a fool. We went to a, uh, this one religious order. We had renovated their entire uh, chapel. And of course, you couldn't tell that it was a chapel anymore. And so they were celebrating mass that we were going to give a talk. And they had no kneelers. And so of all the people, they had about 150 people there. There were only three people, four people that were on their knees. And that was us, four fools. And we just, we just went down there and we kind of put our nose on the railing. And that's how we went through the mass. That's, that's being a fool. Will you kneel when everyone else stands? Will you kneel when everyone else sits? It's being a fool for Christ. Will you be that symbol, that sign in the world? Will you speak up? Now, today it's dangerous to speak up. You know, years ago, uh, if you spoke up, the worst thing that could happen is somebody would answer you back. Today you could get shot. You could get stabbed. But I can't help it. When somebody uses the name of my Lord in vain, it's not me because, you know, I'm self-preservation. I don't want to go. I don't think it's my time, right? But I can't help saying, please don't. Please don't use my Lord's name in vain. This little, little, little saint, we, we wrote a book about young saints, all young saints as role models for the young people. Dominic Savio, little kid, 12, 13 years old. <clears throat> he used to get physically ill if somebody would take the name of of God in vain, he'd say, death, yes, sin, no. One day, 13, 14 years old, one day uh, he insisted that the family say prayers before meals. God. No, 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 no. And uh, the, the, I remember the one day where they had guests and they didn't say. And this guy didn't say this. He, did, he, didn't, say, he didn't say grace before starting to eat. And the little guy got up and he left the table. And, the and parents, he was angry. And the parents went after him. He said, how could you be so rude? He said, rude? He said, the man is an animal. How can you have people in here eating with us? We're animals. Animals eat without praying first. You see? You see? The thing about the bed, you know, using our Lord's name, there were these guys, and they really looked like they were tough. And you know, I also have to worry because they wouldn't hit me. They'd go after my husband. But I, it just slipped out, you know? And I, I said, Oh, please don't use the name of my Lord in vain. And do you know what they said? Oh, we're so sorry. It's a bad habit. See? But nobody is willing to say, wait a minute, don't offend my Lord. I can't handle it. Again, with his little Dominic Savio, when he went to the oratory of Don Bosco in Turin, he came across these two young boys who were arguing. And they were really getting into some heavy arguing. They getting to the point where they were starting to curse about each other's mothers. You know, when you get to that point, he stopped them. He said, "Please, before you say another word like that, hit me, hit me." And the boy said, "I don't want to hit you. I love you. I have nothing against you." Then he turned to the other boy who was who was having the fight. You do the same thing before you say another word against his family or his mother. Hit me. And he wouldn't hit him. And so he got them to apologize to each other. Now, it doesn't always work, but it does work a lot. One of the great saints that lived is Don Bosco. And Don Bosco um, did something that made him extremely unpopular. Saints were not popular. They were very difficult to live with, and sometimes they didn't make life too easy for people. Like Mother Angelica, you either love her or you hate her. There's nothing in between. Well, that's the way it was with most of the saints. 